Mother's Day. You know, um, it can be a challenging time for some people. Those who have lost their moms. Those who are trying to be moms but can't. So I'll spend a few moments here. My wife is going to help me a little bit. And, um, and so uh, to talk and reflect about women of courage. I want to share some quotes with you from some women that will at least make you think and ponder. Catherine Hepburn, who was a rebel in Hollywood during her time, she says this, if you obey all the rules, you miss the fun. I love that. You know, Marie Curie, the first woman, actually, first person to win two Nobel Peace Prize. She did it in two different categories. Say it. Nobel. Yes. Nobel Prize. I'm sorry, not the Peace Prize, the Nobel Prize. My, my fault. Thank you, Dominique. Both in physics and in chemistry. Trailblazers. Uh, in our lives. You know, um, we think about other people. Dorothy Thompson. She said, only when we are no longer afraid, then do we begin to live. She, of course, was one of the journalists who spoke out against Nazi Germany and actually, actually was expelled from Germany during that time. And these are people who are speaking from experiences. And I don't know where you draw your inspiration from, but one of the most inspirational relationships is our mothers. I mean, you think about it. They said if you were going to pay a woman to be a mother, it will be about $160,000 a year. Oftentimes when people ask me, what did your mother do for a living? Well, she took care of seven children. Because people would ask, did she work? Of course she worked. She worked harder than my dad did. <laughs> Take care of seven children who was born within 10 years. That's a lot of work. A mom, of course, is a doctor, a psychologist, a teacher, sometimes a lawyer, a caretaker, a housekeeper, a chef, an accountant, a chauffeur, sometimes even a marketing agency, <laughs> a bodyguard. I'll never forget what Drew Barrymore said when she was in an interview with David Letterman, and she was she was being asked about her mom. And she said one day her mom went to the schoolyard and went to a kid and punched him in the mouth and he started bleeding. Her mom just was willing to do whatever to protect her. She'll never forget it. Sometimes you gotta be a bodyguard. Sometimes you gotta be a coach. Whatever role and responsibility that we have, Jesus elevated women way ahead of his time. Sad is the time that we actually have to even use that term to elevate a woman. You never hear the term, let's elevate a man. It's just assumed, right? But it's amazing that we live in a world even to today where things have to be done in order for us to help people understand what we value, what is true. But we'll continue to fight. Right? We'll continue to struggle. And that's okay. As he crossed gender, as he crossed social barriers, and even racial barriers, and even religious barriers, and even righteousness barriers. She was stunned that he would actually speak to her. 
And we think about the first people to see the risen Christ who spread the news about the risen Christ was Mary, Joanna, and Mary, and, and to realize that the role, you should do a study in it sometime, the role that women played in the ministry of Jesus, Martha and Mary. And the incredible, incredible role that he elevated women to. And of course, the way that he took care of his mom. And so this morning, we're going to just talk about this a little bit. I'm going to have my wife come on, uh, come on up and share a little bit. But to think about not only mothers, while well, that's an incredible, incredible role that we play, but women in general. And it's important that this is not just a punchline or something to score points in a society to be politically correct, but to do what is right. That Jesus was so much beyond his time and elevation. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that this morning. We'll examine the school scriptures and hopefully we'll go celebrate our mom over lunchtime. Okay, all right. Here is the most beautiful, most awesome mom of them all. My wife, Melanie. <laughs> wow. He always has all these awesome things to say about me, but um, I don't always get to say how amazing I think he is. <laughs> um, and he really is. He's, uh, yeah, I won't share too much because I'll start <laughs> crying because I'm already on the verge of crying. And anybody who knows me knows that's not a very difficult task um, to be on the verge of crying. But um, Mother's Day is a special time for me. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about my mom, which is really cool. This is her first Sunday back after her long surgery. Um, but I also just want to take an opportunity just to share a little bit about um, just my convictions about women in general um, and the incredible love I have for Jesus because of his um, love for women and the way that he treated women in the scriptures. Um, so I grew up um, with a mom, and uh, I was very privileged to not only be close to my mother, but really close to my grandmother. Um, my mom lost her dad when my mom lost her dad when you were seven. Were you seven years old? Six years old. So very tragic um, car accident. Um, and so you know, my grandmother raised eight kids on her own. Um, you know, basically was raising the eight kids and then had to start supporting them financially. Um, I think she was in her 40s when this happened. So uh, my grandmother always either lived with us or lived near us, um, literally down the street. So she was very much a part of my life. Um, so I had the privilege of growing up with two really strong women. Um, and so they, they, and I also had the privilege of knowing my great-grandmother, who was another unbelievable woman, <laughs> um, kind of like the uh, village doctor uh, Witch doctor? No, I don't know. Um, today we would call her an herbalist, uh, but she, th in South Africa, they called th her a witch doctor, but she was really an herbalist. Uh, but really amazing, amazing women who took on a lot in their lives um, for different reasons uh, and really raised their families because, again, my I didn't know my great-grandfather because he died, again, before I was um, around. But I say all of that to say, um, you, I... I did not realize as a young girl what I had. Um, you know, kids are rarely grateful. Uh, it just it's You don't know what you have until you don't have it or until you have an opportunity to reflect and have perspective. And so I didn't really realize the tremendous legacy that I was, pa was passed down to me until I actually started having children. Um, and then, you know, as I grew up, my relationship with my mom went from, um, you know, mother, daughter um, to friend. And so um, one of the phenomenal gifts my mom and I got to have was that um, I became a disciple. And then years later, she became a disciple. And so us journeying from uh, mother-daughter relationship without knowing Jesus to mother-daughter relationship knowing Jesus opened up uh, 
an opportunity that I don't know that we would have had had we not. I think our relationship would have been close, but it would probably have always stayed mother-daughter. Um, I don't know that it would have transitioned quite as amazingly as it has if we had not become disciples. But because we both gave our lives to Christ, we, sh we, we got to share who we were as women. And she shared her history with me, and she shared her struggles and her journey and all that she went through growing up in apartheid South Africa. Um, if you look at my mom, she's very fair-skinned. If you meet my dad, my dad is very dark-skinned. And so um, because it was a culture based on the color of your skin and the color of your skin um, giving you more privilege, so if you were lighter, you did have more privilege, uh, my mom grew up in a family that was actually um, my grandmother's sisters. Um, you know, they, they looked more Caucasian and so chose to live that way and so lived even in neighborhoods that we didn't go into because we weren't allowed to. Um, and so, so this, she grew up in this environment where um, she was limited by what she was even able to do, the classes she could take and all of those things. Um, and then I got to hear through her a lot of the journey of my grandmother. Um, and, and then I got to share my journey with her. You know, things that you are fearful to tell your parents because you think they had no idea <laughs> what I was doing. <laughs> they feared it, and they were right because I was doing all those things they did not want me to do. And so we, we've had this opportunity to share all of those things, the deep, the dark, the ugly, the good, the bad. Um, and so what it's done is it's created this amazing tapestry of strength, I feel like, that I've been able to gain and pass on to my daughter. Um, and I share all of that to say, you know, one of the unique things I love about Jesus is Jesus had a lot of commands, right? I mean, there's a lot of things he taught people. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is just like, <laughs> it is the, it's the sermon of sermons to let you know what does he believe about mostly everything. Uh, but there's just some things Jesus was silent in terms of commanding. Um, and one of them was the role of a woman. Like, he never actually said, he said, a new command I give you, love one another. You know, do this with your money, do this. But he never actually delineated what a woman should be in society, who she should be, um, how we should treat her, that kind of stuff. But anyone who's read the Gospels will, will clearly see the respect and the honor that he had for women and how he was able, th through his love and example, to elevate the role of a woman in a time when it was j women were second-class citizens. They, they were not on the same level. They just didn't have rights. Um, you know, we, we, in our modern day, uh, you know, see this, the rights of women having grown, but it, it was significantly worse <laughs> in the days of Jesus. Um, and so I want to highlight one story because here's one of the reasons everyone kind of has their own thoughts about why Jesus didn't, you know, specifically say do this and don't do this. Would have made it easier for us, I think, but I want to highlight a story, and it's the story about the woman who's caught, um, who's bleeding. And Jesus is in a crowd. Um, I'm not going to take the time to read the scripture in Matthew, but he, he's in a crowd of people. It's in Matthew 9, 22, and people are pressing against him, and he feels power leave him. And he's like, who touched me? And the apostles are like, dude, it's like <laughs> um, hundreds of people. What do, you, what do you mean? And he's like, no, you know someone touched me, power has left me, and he pauses his whole sort of journey, whatever it is that he's doing at the moment, and he stops to find this person. Now, I believe Jesus already knew who it was, right, because the Bible says he knows all things, um, but I believe he took this moment to teach us, and he stops everything, and he turns around, and he has this interaction with this woman who to be in the situation that she was in, she was bleeding for many, many years. Uh, in the Jewish culture, if you were during that time of the month, you had to actually separate yourself and go to a separate tent. And you weren't allowed to be a part of regular society until that time had passed because you were considered unclean. 
So here is this woman who's breaking through all kinds of barriers just to touch Jesus, to be near him because she knows the power of Jesus, and she gets a touch of his cloak, and she, and she has this moment where she is healed. And so Jesus comes to her. Now, he did not have to engage with her. The deed was done. She was healed. She could go on her merry way and live a healed life, and who knows all that that would have meant for her life. But, but there was something else he did, and Je- Jesus did this so often. There was something else he did with that woman. He came to her, he looked her in the eye, and he had her tell him her story, like tell him her life. How did you get here? What happened? And I don't believe their interaction was just these few words. I believe there was, an, there was a communication with each other. Not only do I think it teaches us how to love people, this story, but I think Jesus demonstrates in this example and so many others with women what women do. This is who, what women do, right? We don't go into a situation and look at the facts. We are constantly looking at what the facts produce and what do I do with that. So if somebody's lost their mom, there's all the physical things that need to be done, right? But it's, it's the woman is like, well, what's, what does that mean to that person? And they want to engage on a deeper level. There's a nurturing quality to women. And I think Jesus brought that out by that example and so many other examples. He wasn't just saying to her, I love you, I see you, you I value you. I think he was saying to all of us, this woman and what I'm doing with her, this is how you ought to be. This is, this is who women are. This is what they do. This is what they bring to an environment. So whether you are a mother or you're not a mother, I actually think we are mothers by nature in the way we treat one another, by the way we interact with humanity. Um, you know, people often say uh, a church without women would, would be, um, it would be, I, wouldn't, I don't think it's going to be awful, but it would lack that sense of home because that's just what women do by who God created us to be. And so I wanted to share that. And then I wanted to close out because I do have an opportunity to share um, a little bit about my mom and my relationship with my mom. Um, I wrote her a card, and the card says, Mom, friend, teacher, cheerleader, guide, listener, coach, comforter, confidant, and helper. All of those things, by the way, is Jesus <laughs> and God. A mother is one who can take the place of others time and time again. Thank you for being ev- my everything. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. And then I wrote, Dearest Mom, <coughs> I'm so grateful for cards. <laughs> it's true. You wrote that? I did. I wrote that. <laughs> These are my words, not Hallmark, Um, because words often escape me when I try to consider all that you've been to me throughout my life. Recently, the women had this midweek where we um, were to get together and pray, but we were to share, um, you know, one woman that we consider to be a hero, and it's funny because my mom and I were in the same group, and Danielle was there. Um, and we're praying, and then we each get to share, and both for my mom and I, our hero was each other. Um, The best word today that I can use is inspiration. (coughs) You never cease to amaze me with your ability to embrace whatever comes your way and to do it with grace and grit. You are one of the strongest women I know, I count it an honor to call you mom, confidant, sister, and friend. I love you, mom. I thought that today was going to be a worship service, not a cry fest. (laughs) What in the world is going on here? We're going a little longer than we normally do, but as someone said, when you have tears in your eyes, you can't see the face in your clock. (laughs) 
Um, and, and so um, I got a couple more things to share here, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. But sometimes, if you were anything like me, some of these women I did not know. And that's a problem with me and our society. That we have to dig as if we are a geologist to find out the impact. And I wish that there's a day that we don't have to use the phrase, let's elevate the women in our society anymore because there'll, there'll be no need for it. But we journey on. Malala, I'm sure most of you know who Malala is. If not, I'll educate you a little bit. She won the Nobel Prize, the Peace Prize. <laughs> she, was a, she was a Pakistani girl. She was the youngest ever to win the Nobel Peace Prize. She was 17 years old when she won it. And she was the one that was speaking out for education on behalf of all the women, the children especially, in Pakistan. She was shot in the head by the Taliban. And yet she journeyed on, and she started speaking. And she said, when the whole world is silent, even one voice becomes powerful. And there are a lot of things that we ought to be speaking about that we're silent on. And perhaps we need to be the salt of the earth, the light on a hill. That as disciples of Christ, not because we want to create controversy, but we want to do what is right. Isaiah 49. We'll look at a few scriptures, and then, like I said, we'll go have lunch. Isaiah 49 in verse 15, that is what it says. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. You know, you'll never forget the, mother, the child that you nurse as a mother, right? Never. And yet, one of the things that God does is uses that relationship with the mother and the child to help us to understand who he is and what he's like, that, that specialness in that relationship. That ability to remember that God, as impossible as it might be, that your mom could forget you, that our God will not forget you, that our God will always have compassion. And sometimes that's a challenge. And that's why I appreciated so much what Karen shared. She shared about how God was defining her and shaping her. Or as Melanie was sharing about mom and growing up in apartheid South Africa and how as a disciple, the struggle, she was studying the Bible to learn forgiveness of people that have stomped on you and treated you with such, such disregard. That forgiveness now is not a punchline. It's reality. And yet God says, that even as impossible as it might be, that he will never forget. That's the specialness in this relationship. And he says, I want to look at you through this prism. This relationship of a mother to their child. Or he, we're not going to turn there, but in, in the book of Timothy, Paul writes, actually let's turn there. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5, real quick. It says this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Should be right there. I'm sure it is. It says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I'm also persuaded now lives in you also. It's amazing. Timothy, who was apprentice, an apprentice of Paul, his faith began with his mother and his grandmother. 
And the role, moms, I'm not sure if you realize, I didn't include missionary trainer or faith builder as one of the, one of the jobs, but that apparently was one of the jobs here. That it was not, I was this seminary trainer, if you would. The roles. Who knows? Who knows? That role that you have in your child, what destiny lies before them that you are allowing, God is allowing you to shape. I wonder if Mary ever understood the magnitude, especially when she was just a child, raising the Lord of glory. But to realize that the role that mom has to play in building the faith of their children starts with us being faithful as well. Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, we read about another attitude that Paul says we need to have in regard to our mothers and fathers in this case, but tonight we're talking about our mothers. It says in chapter 6 and verse 1, children... Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you, that you may enjoy long life on earth. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 20, so we'll put these two scriptures together. In Proverbs chapter 20, in verse 20, we read about the flip side what God thinks about not doing that. In verse 20, chapter 20, verse 20, it says, If someone curses their father or mother, their lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. And so we have the idea that we should honor our father and mother. It will go well with you. It comes with a great promise. And you'll have a long life. Cool. 2020 says, you don't do that, there are some consequences. And so, I know there are times that we think, man, you don't know my mom. <laughs> you may be right, but God knows her. You know, and in Proverbs chapter, chapter 19, let's go to the uh, chapter 19, verse 11. We'll wrap this all up right now. It says in verse 11, A person's wisdom yields patience. It is the one's glory to overlook an offense. There is no relationship like a mother to their child in regard to forgiving them when they've done something wrong. I mean... Some of you perhaps have conflict with your spouse right now because your spouse is not uh, dealing with your children the way you ought to because she's overlooking an offense. <laughs> there is no place, and I mean no place in this world that I know, whatever happens, I can go to mom's home and she wouldn't care in what in the world you have done. She's going to give me a hug and a kiss. That's what moms do. And it's sort of like, it's sort of like our father in heaven. That he says, listen, I don't know. And I don't know what you've done. Well, he, he knows what he's done. But he says, I will pull you to me and I love you irrespective of what you have done. You know, it's amazing why Jesus drew so many, so many people to him. Because he led with love. If you don't know ever what to do, love is the answer. You know, my wife and I were talking about this, and, and I'll, I'll say some things for you to think about. 
And sometimes I'll do this and, and he'll say, Tony's lost his mind. You know, it's eerie to me that Jesus was absolutely silent on homosexuality. Silent. Because he shied away from controversy? I don't think so, right? Because he shied away from saying some things. Well, he said, no way to the Father except through me. That, that's pretty controversial. He talked about divorce and remarriage. That, that was pretty, some controversy there. Whatever. Tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners. They were an audience to Jesus all the time. And I think even in our church, about the role of women in our congregation. And we think about these things, and I sometimes I feel uncomfortable. I, I, I ask myself, why do I feel uncomfortable? Is it because I have religious convictions? Is, is it how I grew up? And, and I never question. Always question. Truth embraces question. He does. There's no fear in it. If this is real, if this is not a game, if this is not something we're trying to just simply have a social club, if it's the truth, it is not a fear, afraid of question. About anything. We've got a challenge. The sacred cows that we have in our minds and in our hearts. And Jesus was not afraid to do that, especially with his relationship with women. And so today, as we honor our mothers, today, as we honor the people who brought us into this world, maybe, and I don't know, I don't know how, what that gap is like, maybe a conversation needs to begin. Maybe forgiveness needs to be a part of our conversation. Maybe let's start somewhere. Some of us, we don't have that issue. Man, express. Don't just think, oh, my mom knows. Called my mom this morning. Told her, mom, you're the greatest mom ever. And I thank God that you're in my life. Call her every Mother's Day. And I let her know that. She is so incredible. And I want her to know that. She's 78 years old. I don't know how much longer. My dad's 85. And I hopefully that she doesn't just feel special by me on Mother's Day, but at least on this day, she needs to feel special. Amen? All right. We've got a couple of, uh, we've got a couple of announcements. And we have one of the blessed moms in this congregation who prepared something for us and Melanie's going to share a little bit about that. By the way, if you guys ever wonder why I have her come up here, because you guys are going to say, if she, if he can land something like this, he must be something. So <laughs> listen, there's ulterior motives. I, I may not be anything, but I'm smart in that area. She's got a couple of things to say. We have got a couple of gifts to uh, hand out. And then uh, go have great lunch with your mom. Amen. Amen. Um, thank you, Tony. That was an awesome um, lesson and uh, just really encouraging us. Um, I love when Tony talks about Jesus because he gets like a special kind of passion when he starts talking about Jesus. And then when he starts talking about if this is real, like that's his wheelhouse, you know, when he starts. I love it. 